Um, thanks for sticking around for the afternoon session. Um, you've probably noticed that throughout the day we're going um, uh, back and forth between sort of uh, big level issues and uh, cases of specific places so that we can dive a little bit deeper into some of the issues. This afternoon's panel, um, I think we're, we're kind of trying to bring it all together here. Um, we're talking a little bit about donor coordination, a little bit about um, what it is donors do well, what it is donors do poorly, um, specifically in the context of a place that is, um, I believe, the newest country in the world, and um, a place where there is a lot of uh, donor attention, um, not uh, clearly as uh, to the degree of uh, Afghanistan or Haiti, uh, but there's a lot of uh, attention, and um, it would be useful for us to take a look um, at this particular case to see how donors are doing so far. Um, I can think of no better person to, um, to uh, lead and moderate this, pandru, uh, this panel than uh, Andrew Natsios, um, who barely needs an introduction. Um, uh, as you know, he was a former aid administrator um, for USAID. And um, I will leave the remainder of the panel in his capable hands. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you very much. Uh, I am not going to make my remarks until the end, believe it or not. Okay? So, because uh, I know I may throw a couple of hand grenades and I want to do that a little bit separated from lunch. You know, I don't want to make anyone ill after lunch. So, uh, what we're going to do is have Francois give a overview on the broader issues, the context, the scene setter. And then Jason is going to speak about coordination in terms of ABA. And uh, Jason has been in Sudan, South Sudan, the border for like 18 years. I have to just tell you a quick story. I, w I went uh, to my, to my uh, when I became aid administrator, my first trip was to, Af to uh, Sudan. And uh, I went up to the border and Brian uh, De Silva, our old friend, uh, who I worked with for 24 years, had me interviewed by Jason. And Jason had gone into the uh, Nuba Mountains for six months alone, alone. And he gave me a report, and this is the combat's going on now, there's a civil war's going on. And he's being shelled and everything else. Very brave man. And I said, do you work for me? He said, well, I work for you. I said, are you a foreign service officer? He said, no. Are you a PSC? No. Are you, who are you? He said, well, I work for you. I said, how do you work for me? It turns out, I shouldn't say this actually, but he was on a, uh, contract that Brian had through the Department of Agriculture that the embassy was not quite aware of or he wouldn't have been allowed in the Nuba Mountains. <laughs> in the middle of combat, he said, we knew we had to get around all the security restrictions, so we sent Jason in through another means because you would want a first-hand report on what was going on. He was in there for three or four months. He was a very brave man, but he knows the context. Uh, John Temin is going to talk about the politics in Juba within the ruling party, which is profoundly affecting the uh, donor coordinate, in fact, profoundly affecting everything. And, uh, and John is the head of the uh, Horn of Africa effort, particularly in Sudan uh, at USIP. Francois is, of course, from the United Nations. So let's uh, have, Francois, if you could speak first. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to, um, Having me here, and uh, indeed, I think what I would like to try and do is provide a scene setter for the current situation in South Sudan, and the challenge is that uh, all international partners are facing to try and, and help the, the newest uh, world nation, uh, you know, make progress towards its own, um, I would say, stabilization and peace consolidation agenda. We have a very, very particular, very peculiar situation in in in, in South Sudan, which I think it's uh, important uh, to grasp. First of all, I want to try and, and, and suggest that uh, we have, uh, you know, of course, today and in the past few days, and uh, uh, there is a crisis, there is a, an emergency situation in one uh, area of the country. Uh, it's in within a, a state uh, at the eastern uh, periphery of the country, Jongle State, where you have had a conflict which has been escalating um, based on intercommunal uh, violence, the legacy of the war. Uh, new rebel groups, so quite a, an explosive mix, and it has had a very destabilizing effect and a, a dramatic humanitarian effect on the civilian populations. But the point I would like to make is 
and this is important when you when you try and think and consider you know South Sudan as a whole is that um, the country itself, despite all its challenges, is not as a whole necessarily in crisis. And the situation in Jungle that it, you may uh, you know hear about and we'll probably discuss a bit further is not necessarily representative of uh, the overall picture in the in the country. In fact, a couple of months ago, I led an exercise before the mandate renewal of the mission in South Sudan that you have of, of review of the mandate to try and see whether this mandate was adapted to the current situation. And in reviewing this as a normal planning process, we look at the threat assessment, we look at you know the, the, the issues the, the, that needs to be addressed uh, in terms of, because to try to realign and adjust our priorities and in particular, uh, refocus and align uh, the resources which is at our disposal uh, in the mission to address you know these priorities. And if you look at the overall picture of South Sudan, which uh, you know we did, we found that that we could look at each of the ten states of the country and categorize them, you know, very in a very simple uh, fashion into those green, uh, you know, green states, orange states, and and red states. Uh, and the red states would be the a state which is currently destabilized, that's a state of Zhongli, then orange state is states which would be at risk of destabilization. And yes, you still have states in South Sudan which are at risk of destabilization because of the legacy of the war, the fact that so many ex-combatants, uh, South Sudanese combatants, have come back to the country. And the border states of unity, of Upper Nile, uh, also those affected <clears throat> by fairly intense cattle rustling in the tri-state area of Warap, uh, Unity and uh, uh, Bar Gaza are, you know, at risk of destabilization. But the government is taking care of the situation, supported by the mission. And then you have five others, which we we thought were in a situation, you know, we categorize as green, meaning that you may have local tensions, you may have local conflicts, but they are being managed. Sometimes they are being managed with an excessive use of force, and that's what we had earlier this year in the town of Wao uh, in western Bar Gazal, and this led to a temporary, you know, to a, a limited escalation. But overall, the country is not doing, I would like to say, as badly as sometimes it is perceived. And I know that, you know, in the past week there has been many, you know, public statements make highlighting the need for the country to make more progress, to address corruption, to address governance issues, and all this is true. The situation also in Zhongli State is true, but the overall picture is also a picture of progress, is also a picture of, I would say, um, tremendous effort in view of tremendous hardships. Uh, and it, it is a picture which in terms of, therefore, you know, of, of uh, coordination of international action uh, is difficult to address because in order to be able to move, to make a difference and to move the country and the states of the country, which are, for instance, in a red or orange situation towards a green situation, you need not only to invest into crisis management, but you also need to invest in the building of the capacities, in the building of the uh, you know, state uh, uh, ability to address its own situation, which is the mandate of the mission, of the UN mission. And these two competing priorities represent a challenge in view of the limited resources which exist. But unless you address consistently, effectively, and I would say at the same level, these two competing priorities, you are going to lose, you may you know, win a few battles, but you are going to lose the war. You may actually succeed into improving the short-term situation you know, of people affected by conflict, but you are not investing into resolving the issues that led to this crisis and to this conflict. And that's what we need in South Sudan right now. These double investment, not just into crisis management and, and, and uh, relieving the, the, you know, the, the, the suffering of people affected by conflict, but also building the capacities of the state to address by itself the root causes of this conflict at national and local level. And I'll, I'll go down I mean, to the details uh, quickly. Uh, of this issue and how we can do that. So that's the first paradox or the first challenge which I would see to mention. Another one now which is more globally political is, as you know, 
South Sudan, until very recently, relied on oil resources, the, the oil revenues uh, for 98% of its budget, and decided to shut down oil production, leading into a very harsh period of austerity. This was related to the deterioration of this relation uh, with uh, its northern neighbor, from which uh, you know it gained independence, Sudan, and to the fact that it feel South Sudan felt that you know their oil revenue was stolen from them, and to stop this you know theft of oil revenue, they had to stop the oil production. Now the consequences, of course, for um, you know the the new state to be able to deliver on its peace building priorities on its uh, beginning of you know, service delivery and developing, developing of its capacities were dramatic. I mean, you can imagine, 98% of the revenue of the state, gone. So we have this particular you know, political environment where international partners are dealing with the government, which is still, um, I would say, inspired by the need to protect itself and to face and to stand up two threats from its neighboring Sudan, and that informs its decision-making, that also informs its, in, its internal politics, and sometimes it is used to, to put its internal politics, you know, and uh, to, to close the, the, the internal dynamics, but it is a, a parameter which makes it even more difficult, I would say, which represents another big challenge, is that to a certain extent, and we can, uh, you know, we, we will be able to discuss that hopefully uh, later on, the one of the challenges of, of donor engagement and coordination and working together with South Sudan is that you have to consider the um, bilateral relations with Sudan also. You have to consider action, political action and consistency in the engagement which addresses not just the internal situation of South Sudan but addresses also the relation with Sudan and to a certain extent uh, what uh, also the, the internal dynamics uh, within Sudan. So the donor policy and the diplomatic you know, policy needs to be articulated around you know, this specificity of a country which has still very much its energy you know, geared towards not just its internal development, peace consolidated issues, but its external, uh, the, the external threats that it feels it is still uh, you know, facing. Uh, from the north. And the last point I, I would like to make to introduce this is that in view of these two particular challenges, the United Nations, just wanted to, to specify a, a um, uh, couple of, 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 of uh, I would say, interventions that the U United Nations is trying to coordinate. First of all, at national level, so we have, uh, you know, uh, engaging with the government of, of South Sudan, we have two missions. We have a mission. We have the the main mission, the mission for South Sudan, and we have a, a mission which deals with the territory of Abia, which future was not determined during the the CPA, and uh, uh, which is now also mandated to support, I would say, the tensions at the border within a zone which is at the border, which is supposed to be demilitarized. And then we have the mission in South Sudan. The mission in South Sudan, in particular as the mandate to facilitate and coordinate the implementation of, or, or let's say, the support to the management or the implementation of key benchmarks from the country. Among them, you have you know, such critical processes such as the constitutional review process, uh, the organization of the uh, next elections, but also the absolutely fundamental issues of uh, the demobilization and, and disarmament of, of combatants and, uh, and the uh, security sector reform. So, the United Nations has been mandated to really be the overall you know, facilitator and coordinator and supporter of such, of these huge processes. We'll, let's be realistic, we'll uh, you know, be faced with uh, enormous operational challenges, and I, I can get into that uh, later on, and also we'll, we'll need some time, particularly for DDR and SSR. And in addition to that, I would say, or let's say to support that uh, operationally, uh, the uh, mission has, um, this has organized itself to be able to implement its mandates in a decentralized fashion. <coughs> so it is in the process of building uh, in uh, over 20 counties of the country what we call county support bases. And at the level of county support bases, we bring the different partners, particularly uh, from the mission and from the UN agencies together to work into the implementation both of, I would say, a conflict prevention strategy, 
and, and mitigation uh, when necessary, but also um, development initiatives which are coordinated into what at the same level is called a development portal. So you have both functions of trying to address the political uh, issues and also the immediate needs and requirements of the population in those counties and the neighboring counties. Those, those county support bases are small hubs in each state, out of which uh, the United Nations and some of its partners try to project themselves to coordinate their actions in a decentralized fashion. So these are two of the modalities which uh, uh, articulate the, the, the UN position. I leave it there um, and hand over to Jason. Uh, thank you for the invitation, and Andrew, thank you for the introduction. I, I'm sure my visa to Sudan is being reviewed <laughs> at, at this point. Hold on. Let me... Okay. This is a water yard. It provides enough water for 5,000 people. If you put this water yard in the politically contested and extremely volatile area of Abia, <coughs> straddling the border between Sudan and South Sudan, is it a humanitarian response for the 100,000 people that have been displaced from the violence trying to return? Or is it a development response? Is it an economic growth response, helping the Miseria who move seasonally through the area promote healthy herds? Or is it a democracy and governance response, supporting building confidence in the local government to provide services? Is it the outcome of a local reconciliation conference between the Miseria and the Dinka over natural resources? Or is it the result of over 12 years of sustained negotiations for political solution, 12 years and counting, I should say, for sustained political solution? Um, for Abia, Clearly, it's all of these, and I would argue all of these are stabilization responses. This presentation is going to use Abia as a bit of a, of a focal point, a point of reference, sorry, for a conversation on coordinating local stabilization efforts um, in Abia. The, the, the two seconds on Abia is that the, it was received a protocol. It has a specific protocol within the comprehensive agreement signed in 2005. That protocol has three broad aims. The first aim um, is to provide a homeland for, to secure a homeland for the Dinka Nok. That includes their return to the area and their participation in a referendum on their political status as part of Sudan or part of South Sudan. The second aim is to promote, protect the um, livelihoods of the Miseria who move through the area, specifically their right to graze. And the third main aim of the agreement is to provide significant development dividends to both communities, given the um, complexity of this agreement. This presentation will really focus on one key challenge to donor coordination at the local level, and I think we heard a lot about it over the lunch, the issue of perspectives, perspectives of time, the narratives, space, the geography in which we see, the map we use, who, who we work with, who we serve, and lastly, why. Why is this assistance being provided? The annual cycles used by the humanitarian assistance have to address the kind of the peaks and lulls, but the peaks of thirst, hunger, disease that come season by season through quite extreme variations within Sudan. For those who look at conflict, there's also a seasonality in our annual timeline that helps direct how we respond. That, that conflict is generally associated with migration of Miseria livestock through the area and then tensions. And the time of period where that most likely escalates is pretty typically after the cows move north when they're in, out of harm's way, these violent incidents have the potential to escalate, and they did twice during the interim period um, of the CPA, displacing probably around 100,000 people. If you ask the peace builders, you ask the mission and the others, they'll use a timeline torn out of the back of the agreement, essentially the implementation modalities. And if you talk to the two 
parties to the local, two of the local parties to the conflict, the Missouri and the Dinka, their timeline is different. It goes back to 1964 and tracks a series of violence and reconciliation, tit for tat, back, sorry, back and forth violence over a longer period of time. And if you talk to the Dinkanak, they're talking about 1905 when the British transferred Abye's administration from southern Sudan into northern Sudan. We have a different perspective over time that we need to get our heads around. The map, if we're able to elevate Abye out of its special status, we see that it's entangled, entangled within the larger borderland communities, cut mixed with migration routes and trade routes and natural resources of national relevance and local importance. And it's very hard to separate out Abye from the wider issues that are also between Sudan and South Sudan. And for us, for those aid actors, when we look at this same map, we don't see the same thing. If you're a development actor who's looking for sufficient capacity and sufficient stability in order to provide that development assistance, you would prioritize the more stable area to the north of Abye, where the Missouri start their migration, where they have their residence. Second, you'd go below Abye to Wat upstate, where they have more stability, and Abye would be third. But if you're a humanitarian, the greatest needs would be to the far south of Abye, where not only is the host community poor, but is the the community that they're receiving the displaced people. But if you're a conflict person, this is the priorities you would set. You would try to look at creating parity between Muglad and Abye, and you would look for positive examples to the east and the west. So as, a, as actors, we have a different map when we look and different priorities amongst us. But for the Sudanese, if you're Dinka Nok, the SPLM presented your border to the Abye Boundaries Commission. The Abye Boundaries Commission, which ruled on what was the boundaries of Abye, placed it. Here, that was contested by the government of Sudan. It was later deferred to the permanent court of arbitration who made the boundaries here. That still did not move anywhere. It continued to be rejected by the government of Sudan to a point where there was ideas being floated of a nominal boundary somewhere even smaller, shrinking Abye. That nominal boundary is also somehow lined up to the, to the buffer zone created by UNISFA to separate the, the Missouria and the Dinkanok during this grazing period. And again, if you're Dinkanok, seeing your area shrinking, you also remember the government of Sudan made a position for your exclusive territory not going above the river Kir. And if you're Missouria, this is probably the map you're looking at with a desert behind you and the green grass on the other side of a very thick and scary line. And if you're Sudanese, this is almost unrecognizable. You're looking at a border that looks like it's been shredded. This is not a country that Sudanese would recognize naturally when looking at what was Sudan. And if you, look at the fa if you recognize the fact that southern Kordofan, Blue Nile, and Darfur, that whole southern border is in conflict right now, most of that southern border is in conflict right now, you'd be worried that this is, Abye is part of a slippery slope for the further disintegration of their territory. Who? Who are we serving? Who are we protecting? The weak, are we protecting a lifelong struggle? Are we protecting her interests or are we protecting his interests if they come in conflict with each other? But here's probably where we have the biggest challenge that divides the aid community. This local official, is he our counterpart or is he someone we work around? These young men, are they militia? Are they just armed young men? Are they a source of conflict, angry at the lack of opportunities? Or are they a conflict resource for those with private or political agendas to mobilize? And what's their motivation? Are they there for the money or are they there for ideology? And this group, they seem to be both sides of the formula, the armed, the armed group, SAF and SPLA, they're both a source of stability in some communities and also a source of conflict. We don't want to talk to them in the aid world. We're nervous about talking to them. We'd rather talk to them when they come to us like this. This is when we're ready to engage. And how do they see us? Do they see us as part of the community? Do they see us as outside to the community? Do they see us as coming for our own interests or for theirs? Are they with us? Do they see us protecting their security? And importantly, do they see power? Do they see projected power? Do they see a false promise of security if they run to the compound that they will be let in? Yeah? Sorry, let me back up. But also within us, within our aid community, as a coordinator, thank you. Thanks, Andrew. 
We could barely get the, the UN agencies to meet in the compound of the peacekeeping mission for what it looked like, much less the NGOs. It required UNMIS to build a bar, and then everybody came to meet. Uh, side point. But essentially, to get everybody to sit together, even be seen as being and working together, was a huge challenge. And why, just to conclude. What do people associate the thing we give with the reason why it's given? This water yard, coming back to the beginning, is it seen as promoting the return of Dinkanak to their homeland or providing an opportunity to resettle Misuria into the area so that they could also participate, claim residency, and participate? And when we put our sign up, does it show that we are a counterpart to the government, that we are a partner? Does it show that we are, um, clearly in South Sudan, when you put this sign up, it's very clearly they see it as a responsibility of the government to bring aid. So it's a confidence builder. In some places in Sudan, this, this sign reinforces the message that the government is not taking care of us, it's the international community that is our friend. So we have to understand not just what we do, but what they see us as doing. Are we there for their interests? Have we chosen a side? Do we have a foreign agenda? And just to conclude, humanitarian assistance alone does not address the need for humanitarian assistance. The causes are conflict, they're structural, they're political. Development assistance, if it's scared to come in or cautious to come in until there's sufficient capacity or stability, will only further enforce disparities between communities. Development, uh, conflict mitigation assistance, that's short-sighted, that was pointed out like creating a buffer zone to separate the two parties in ABA or pre preventing election violence at the time of the elections, does it necessarily and in fact can contribute to violence later, the killing of the paramount chief of the Dinkanok when he crossed that buffer zone. The rebel movements that are now in Sudan and South Sudan who don't believe there's political space because the elections were not violent but not sufficient to address their concerns. So in conclusion, we need to think of stability not as the way of shepherding these multiple interventions, but as codependent between those objectives of development and humanitarian assistance requires stability as stability requires those, those interventions. And one of the biggest barriers we find is just our, simply our perspectives as to what, um, into what we're seeing. And our perspectives into time, our perspectives into geography, the maps we use, our perspectives into who we work with and don't work with, and obviously why this assistance is being provided. And again, the photos, I want to just thank, obviously, Tim McCulka, who worked for UNMIS and took a lot of photos, and uh, USAID Sudan and South Sudan Mission for allowing me to use these. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Jason raises a lot of really good questions um, that I hope we can grapple with, as does Francois. I'd like to make the point that, that a lot of what the two of them have just spoken about concerning some of these very important issues in South Sudan and Jonglei and Abia and elsewhere is right now secondary politically in terms of what's happening in South Sudan. And what is dominating the political stage in South Sudan is a, a brewing conflict at the very top of the government, uh, which is between the President Salva Kiir and the Vice President Riek Machar. And for those of you who have, have followed these issues, uh, you know this is nothing new. But I think it is, it is uh, intensified recently. Uh, and certainly in the time that I've been following South Sudan for, for five years or so, uh, it's, it's as bad now as, as I've seen it. Uh, and so I want to talk just a bit about this and to talk about the implications for donors. Um, this, this conflict right now, it's, it's coloring everything. And I think a lot of different issues are being seen through the lens of, of this conflict, uh, including some of the more recent political developments. Uh, there were two prominent ministers who were suspended on charges of corruption. And recently, two state governors have been removed by the president. Uh, which he is allowed to do in the Constitution, but then elections are supposed to happen within 60 days. Um, and all those things are being seen as sort of, you know, this person is in this camp, that person is in that camp. Uh, there are more than two camps. I'm, I'm uh, oversimplifying a little bit, but at the end of the day, it does come down to a, 
really what I see as a zero-sum uh, struggle at the top of the party. And part of the problem is that the party, the SPLM, is not particularly well equipped to deal with this struggle and is the development within the party has has not progressed a lot over the past few years there have been other priorities which is understandable given the referendum and independence and all the state building challenges that come with it um, but I don't see a lot of things moving in South Sudan in a positive direction until this is resolved in some way. That said, I don't see how it's going to be resolved uh, in a particularly positive fashion because I think it is zero sum and I think a lot of groups and particularly ethnic groups are going to look at this as a, as a win-lose equation. This is going to make things difficult for donors, I think, for the foreseeable future because it's going to make it hard to talk to the government and to get a uh, to understand, you know, whether it's the full government that is speaking, and it's going to be hard for the government to to formulate and to implement policy because of some of these internal divisions that are holding things up. I think what we're seeing in South Sudan is, is some of the unity that was brought about by the referendum and by independence uh, is starting to fall apart. There was, there was really impressive uh, unity in the run-up to the referendum and the run-up to independence because of that goal that so many people in South Sudan shared and clearly articulated in, in January a couple years ago of becoming independent. Uh, but that also had this temporary effect of, of holding things together, and I think that the, that's wearing off right now. There's also this dynamic of the, of the common enemy that, that is uh, often seen in the North, and that, that still happens, but that's not as persuasive an argument for holding people together as it used to be. Uh, and so the honeymoon period that we did see after the referendum is, is starting to wear away. And so the question, which has been there for some time, but I think is more front and center now, is what uh, unifies South Sudan? And that gets into all sorts of questions about what it means to be South Sudanese and various identity issues that are very important and that a lot of South Sudanese are struggling with right now. Uh, I think the bad news from the donor perspective is that I'm, I'm skeptical that the international community and donors and diplomats are able to have much impact on these internal struggles that are happening within the party right now. I think these are uh, inside the family things, inside the party things uh, that we have a limited understanding of and that we have a limited ability to affect. And so in some ways it's a, it's a waiting game to see how that plays out. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, I think there is a good deal of evidence that, that donors have been able to influence outcomes in Sudan and South Sudan, especially recently. And I refer in particular to the referendum in 2011 and what I think was the very positive donor and diplomat role in making that process a real success. And we have to remember that there were all sorts of predictions that the referendum was never going to happen, that the North was never going to let the South secede, that it was going to lead to renewed civil war and so forth, and that didn't happen. And that's a real uh, positive uh, conflict prevention story, perhaps, and we don't have a whole lot of those. Uh, the donor community and the diplomatic community had a lot to do with that positive outcome, I think. There was definitely a very domestic explanation, too. Uh, but I think donors played a good role in keeping both parties in bounds in telling the North that they had to accept the referendum, that it was inevitable, in keeping the South focused on the referendum and not considering things like a more unilateral declaration of independence. Um, and the donors also did a very good job in terms of the technical preparations for the referendum, which really had to be squeaky clean, and it was. Uh, and the technical preparations uh, supported by donors had a lot to do with that. But then on the flip side of, of that positive story about the referendum and what was really a, a sole focus on the referendum is the opportunity that I think was missed by, by some of the donor and diplomatic community during the implementation of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, which was for the greater democratic transformation of Sudan and South Sudan. Uh, if you look back at the CPA, it's a very long document uh, that I know, you know some of our panelists were, were very much involved in developing, uh, which has a lot to do with transforming whether it's one or two countries into a more democratic place. Uh, and that really didn't happen during that CPA period. The CPA got boiled down uh, to doing a few things, to, to establishing southern Sudan, to separating the armies, to having an election, to having a referendum. 
uh, all of these vital things, no doubt. Um, but I think a lot of, of people, Sudanese, South Sudanese, and internationals were complicit in uh, removing the focus from the democratic transformation agenda. And so that's why we have a situation right now where uh, certainly in the north, in Sudan, you have a, a less than democratic country. And we're seeing some very concerning signs that, that South Sudan is not uh, developing in, in terms of the democratic governance uh, structures that we'd like to see. And so part of the lesson there, I think, was that there was an emphasis on stability uh, and doing these key things uh, and less of an emphasis on the governance change. And, and full recognition, this is a very easy critique for me to make in hindsight. Uh, and, and maybe things really did need to be focused on those key events or it was going to explode and return to a war that was obviously brutally destructive for millions of people. Um, just to, to start to wrap up, I think part of, part of the message with South Sudan now is that it is time for donors to, to change some of their perceptions of the country. Uh, and for diplomats uh, too, and I think this is happening, but it's probably happening a little bit too slowly. And for for quite some time, the the sort of common narrative was was generally friends with the north and and enemies. Sorry, friends with the south and enemies with the north. And um, that that's over now. Now that now that the south really is an independent country, and I think the south needs to be held more to. Uh, the ideals that they have set out in terms of democratic governance, what they have articulated that they wanted to be during their struggle for independence, and that we're starting to see them not to live up to. Uh, and along the same lines, I think it's time to, to stop comparing South Sudan to Sudan. That's an awfully low bar to set. Uh, I think we need to be looking at uh, a whole lot of other countries if we're looking for comparisons for South Sudan. Uh, you, there's, you sort of often get this narrative about how South Sudan you know, arrested a journalist and well, Sudan arrested 10, and, and they might have, but I don't see how that's particularly relevant. Um, it, it's time to hold them you know, to, their own, uh, to their own standards, I think. Um, so let me just highlight two other things that I think donors are also grappling with. Uh, one is just the, the relief to development transition that we talk about in South Sudan. And this has been an ongoing dialogue for some time, and there's no right answers in this. But it's really hard to figure out the balance between some of the more relief-oriented humanitarian activities that, that save lives and the needs remain massive versus some of the longer-term development uh, activities. And I think this is part of what Jason highlighted so well. The other concern that I hear from, from some donors and diplomats in South Sudan is that there is some uh, complacency, I think, going on within the government uh, about fighting for themselves internationally. For some time, the international community, and particularly the West, has, has you know, fought a lot diplomatically for South Sudan. Uh, but now that they are independent and they have their own Ministry of Foreign Affairs and those sorts of things, it's time for them to be in the lead on that. And that sometimes happens, but it sometimes doesn't. And there's still an expectation of, of the West doing a lot of the heavy lifting on that. And I think the appetite uh, is not there the way it used to be. Um, so just to conclude, I, I don't think it's fair to, to call South Sudan a failed state. And I think it's probably a little bit premature after two years of existence to say they're the fourth failed, fourth most failed state in the world or something like that. Because this is, you know, someone sent around an article this morning about this being a marathon, not a sprint. I think that was uh, one of your UN colleagues who wrote that. And I think that's absolutely true. Um, but at the same time, I, I think South Sudan is also approaching a pretty dangerous precipice here. Uh, and it is time uh, to be candid with some of the very concerning things that they are facing right now. Uh, and, to, uh, and to be very concerned about some of the political struggles that are happening uh, at the very top of the government in Juba right now. Thanks very much. Let me make a few provocative statements here at the end. Okay. Let me just observe from a donor perspective some of the issues and some of the limitations. I've heard some earlier panels which I found entertaining, amusing, but a little bit misleading, frankly, in what the realities are. First, what is AID's challenge? Who do they report to? We asked the career staff in the 90s, before I was administrator, who is your customer? Who do you report to? We would th thought, you would think an aid agency would say the people in the field, the groups we did, you know what they answered? The career staff? The US Congressional Oversight Committees. That's who we report, and they do. 
There are 12 congressional oversight committees. They often tell you to do opposite things from each other. They control your appropriation. They control the laws and the implementation of the laws under which you do your work. Okay, every single program, I don't mean just the general appropriation, every single individual program has to be approved by the Congressional Oversight Committee. They get the, the documents in batches and they can say, I, I don't like this, so we're not doing this. One committee, and this is the 12 committees over CAID in Congress. Then there's the Inspector General's office. If they crap you up with a terrible audit, you're gonzo. Your career is over as a career person, you're political, if you're a political appointee, you're over if you have a really bad IG audit. And then you have the General Accounting Office, an arm of the Congress, they also oversee and they fight with the IG to see whether they can trash you worse than the IG does. And then in Iraq and Afghanistan, there's this special IG who competes with a regular IG to see who can criticize you more. They actually do compete with each other to make more extreme statements because that's how they get their money. They actually say, I saved the taxpayer all this money from these incompetence at AID or any federal agency. This is not just AID, by the way. This goes on across the federal government. And these agencies, these oversight agencies, run AID, they run the State Department, they run DOD, they tell you what to do or else they issue press releases, they can make your life miserable. Then you have the National Security Council, the White House, the President of the United States does have a small say in these matters since he was elected to be the head of the executive branch and he gives orders to AID or state to do certain things. Now state now controls, all, every line item in AID's budget is now controlled by the State Department under the reorganization that took place in the last few years. AID has no budget independence left anymore whatsoever. There were uh, a decentralization orders signed by the administrator, I think it was in 1978, to decentralize to the lowest level, AID was the most decentralized aid agency in the world by far. We actually did a study of this in AID and there were nine steps in the program development process and AID mission directors had control over seven of the nine in this study. The only aid agency in the world, bilateral, multilateral, that had that much decentralization. Those were all rescinded in the last few years. The aid administrator has no authority to spend any line item in his own budget or her own budget without the State Department approving every single line item. So there is no independent AID now at the table without specific approval. Then you have OMB. Now, people wonder why there isn't more uh, buy-off. I mean, why isn't there more buy-in in the development? Why don't we ask people? Well, you have 279 earmarks that make up the AID budget. You have to spend that money. If you don't, you're in violation of federal law. In fact, you can get go to jail, actually, if you exceed some of these uh, limits. It's a very serious matter to spend money you don't have under the uh, federal statutes, federal law. The federal acquisition regulations, 1,978 pages of those regulations, tell AID officers how to spend money. In fact, they tell all federal agencies how to spend money. So. This is also the case in Britain, in the EU, and other donor governments. So if you have a choice as an officer to take orders from Washington, from the State Department, or NSC, or if in the context of Southern Sudan, the, the um, Congress, or uh, OMB, or the inspect versus the Southern government, who, who are you going to take orders from? It's pretty clear to me. I mean, anybody here who is, who's ever worked in AID or the Congress knows very well what the realities are. So there is a problem in terms of who the reporting lines are. AID is not an independent agency. It used to be more independent than it is now, but even then it had this oversight. This is new, by the way. Congress before the 1960s did not get involved in the executive management of the executive branch. This is a relatively new phenomenon in federal, the federal government. This is not something that's existed for 200 years. It's new. And I think it screwed everything up massively in my view, but that's, a, that's my opinion. Now, let me make some comments about the implications of this in the field, okay? What are the two most important, most powerful institutions that exist in Southern Sudan today? If you're a Southern Sudan expert, even if you're a highly secularized person, you would not disagree with what I'm saying. One is the church. The fastest conversion, mass conversion to Christianity uh, that in the 20th century took place in Sudan over the last 30 years. And it was not done by missionaries. It was done by other Southern Sudanese. They, ma they mass converted. 
Only the Nuer tribe even is at 50-50%. Now most of the tribes are at 70-80% are Christianized now. And the church is spreading even more powerful. It is the Anglican Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Evangelical Church, Pentecostal Churches. They are virtually the entire cabinet are practicing Christians. They are at church for three hours every Sunday morning. Salva Kiir, if you want to hear what he thinks, you go to the Catholic church he goes to because he preaches often in his own church as a layman. Okay? Now, how often do development agencies do with, deal with the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, the Presbyterian? They don't. They may talk to them at the local level. You think that's in the design of AID or World Bank or UN programs? Absolutely not. Why? In the West, we have a, we have a separation of church and state. We can't spend money developing the hierarchies of these churches. Yet, they are the genuine civil society of Southern Sudan. I might add, this is the same problem in Muslim countries or Buddhist countries. They are the most influential civil society that are genuine with roots in the local community. And yet, we cannot deal with them on a systematic, programmatic basis, even though we may talk to them occasionally, because of the culture of the secular culture of the international and bilateral aid institutions. The second most powerful institution is the military, the SPLA. It's been around since John Garang started the Second Revolt with other leaders in the South. Some people would argue it actually dates back to the First Revolt, which started even before independence in 1956, although it's debatable when the Second War started. I'm sorry, the First War started. The SPLA, who in the international system is designing a large-scale capacity building program. Who does, for example, health care among the SPLA, among the aid agencies? None. In fact, they specifically say no soldiers can be involved in this. If they are, we can't serve them. Under federal law, by the way, that's federal law. Can we feed them if they're hungry? No, can't do that. If the ration system is broken down, we cannot do that. Can we train them? Yeah, we can train them, certain limitations. Can we do literacy programs? In the boat? Absolutely not, there's no literacy. We cannot spend any AID money, neither can most of the European countries. Some of them can do it a little bit, but there's ideological reasons not to do that. I think the most important thing we should be doing right now is strengthening the SPLA as an institution. We are not, we're doing that on a small scale with a $30 million program, most of that is construction projects. Why? When they get involved with 85% illiteracy, no chain of the command, no efforts to deal with international, teach international human rights law, there's a big problem when you send these troops into a ethnic conflict where they are a particular part of an ethnic group. So, I, I, I think there are impositions or there are constraints on the UN, the World Bank, the NGOs, the contractors, the US government, the European aid agencies in a profound way. The last point I would make is this. South Sudan and North Sudan, most developing, are patrimonial states. They're clientel states. People keep control of violence and they keep the society from spinning into chaos through personal relationships and alliances, tribal alliances and political bosses who maintain, I don't use the word political bosses, uh, powerful political figures who control parts of the economy, parts of the military, and have tribal connections. This is true in Afghanistan, it's true in Pakistan, it's true in Southern Sudan. What counts most in a patrimonial state are personal relationships, including with the donors. The Foreign, the Foreign Service Act says no one serves in any country more than four years, three years, four years, except for the PSCs, the personal service contractors and AID. We move them out. And in southern Sudan and Afghanistan, it's only one year or two years. Why? Because they're hardship posts. If you really want to have an effective aid program, in my view, we need to change the Foreign Service Act and send people out for 10 years, which is, by the way, what we used to do in the 50s and 60s and early 70s. You know how long military officers or troops stay in, the, in Iraq, Afghanistan? One year, then they come back. And you say they're all well-trained. Well, personal relationships count in Afghanistan. If the troops have developed personal relationships, after a year, they're gone. So it doesn't make any difference. So we have some serious institutional constraints among donors that has a profound effect on our ability to get work done in these conflict situations, particularly in southern Sudan. And it's, it's particularly intense in southern Sudan because of the nature of the society. Why don't we answer questions now? Okay, who would like to start? 
No comments or questions? Yes. Thank you so much, all four of you, for a very uh, enlightening presentation. Um, some of you referred to positive examples of uh, community level activities and broader development. And thinking about the debates and themes we have heard from previous panels, um, where we as the donors have problems with the messages we're getting from the recipient community, uh, and yet we as the donors may not be well beloved or our motives or our presence may be contested. What about this larger issue of what in this, in a non-development sphere we've called strategies of emulation? of finding local, regional, positive examples where we can point to positive developmental initiatives going on in parts of Africa, not in South Sudan, but might it be quite relevant to how South Sudanese view uh, their own future. Uh, they would have greater traction. I mean, thinking back to the Columbia example, uh, to use Joanna's uh, formulation, an exporter of security, we can debate what that means, but in terms of being a local, credible actor in the region, are there other regional actors in Africa who have more credibility that might suggest a strategy on our part of indirection uh, to avoid some of the brutally difficult problems we're having with donor-recipient dialogues. Thank you. Who would like to respond? <laughs> no one? Jason, would you want to say something? I mean, I, I think you don't have to go too far beyond, even with, you can find the positive examples, as Francois mentioned, even within South Sudan and, and, and areas that are able to overcome the differences that I was presenting in terms of migration and trade and reconciliation. And so I think the idea of looking for, you know, the successes to the east and to the west of Abia, as I was pointing out, um, has a huge opportunity to impact the situation in Abia in that specific case. Um, there are relationships that have been there for a long time that are, that are between communities that have been maintained and protected. Um, but I think you, you raise a point. In some, in some cases, we, we, we had a situation where one, one governor said to, um, to us, um, I really, do I have to have a crisis and fall apart before I get the assistance that you, uh, that you need to provide? That, or, or can I do it when my, you know, or, or will you come when things are going well? And I think a lot of our, you know, reward for failure, reward for problem means we miss a lot of the opportunities that, that, um, that are out there that could be built on, where there is success that could create, I don't know, areas of stability or examples that could have impact. Thank you. Let, let me mention something like this in Afghanistan. The decision was made, I will not say when, because I don't want to attribute it to any particular administration, to spend 80% of the development money, which is a huge amount of billions of dollars, in the Pushtun area and the south and southwest. One, there's a huge absorptive capacity problem. Two, that's where the conflict is. That's why they want to spend the money there. But you can't spend it because of the insecurity. Governors in other areas of Afghanistan were saying, <clears throat> wait a second, <laughs> wait a second here. We're loyal to Karzai, we're loyal to the Americans, we're with them, and we're getting screwed. All the money is going to the people who are revolting. What is the message to us? Well, you need to have a little bit more disloyalty here, a little bit of chaos in order to get some money for our area. So, now I know why they put the money there, because that's where the conflict is. And that's why money was put in the three areas in AID. However, the message to the other areas may not be the right message. So you have what, what would you call, economists would call it a trade-off, okay? You do more of one, you do less of another. <clears throat> there's a consequence for that. These are not, there's no formula for making these decisions. 
But a little bit of balance sometimes, in my view, would be a lot better in terms of how resources are allocated and how, uh, how much attention is spent in areas. So I, I kind of agree with, with what Jason said. Now, let me just mention one point. There was a study done by one of these studies that no one wants to do by AID. <clears throat> I can't remember which contractor did it. It's a brilliant study. And it looked at four countries in post-conflict situations and post-independence. One of them was Botswana. How come Botswana is probably the best governed country in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and one of the best governed countries in the developing world? 12,000 per capita uh, income, uh, none of the very little corruption in the government, services are delivered well, never had a civil war, low levels of violence, and they go back and look at the question of capacity in the government. There was none at independence in 1965. Diamonds were discovered the next year, and they made a decision to do something quite extraordinary. Uh, the president of Botswana at the time's wife was British, and she said apparently to her husband, why don't you ask the British, because they were a British colony, why don't you ask the white British colonial officials to renounce their British citizenship, become Botswana citizens, and stay in the bureaucracy, and become bureaucrats of the new government of Botswana, and stay here. It was supposed to be for a few years. It ended up being, according to this study, 20 to 30 years. They stayed there till they retired. And gradually, uh, the Botswanan black African was, took over, and you have what you have in Botswana right now. That message, by the way, that study was used by people in the United Nations in other places to attempt to recruit career civil servants from Kenya and Ethiopia and Uganda who were retired from those bureaucracies to come help the Southern. The hundreds have been recruited to be brought in, but not in mass enough. So are there things at work? Yes. But the question is doing them in mass sufficiently to change and alter the situation. I'm not sure yet we've been able to do that. But two years is a very short period of time. It's not a failed state. I mean, the United States was far more unstable in the early 1790s than southern Sudan is right now. And Washington led an army into Pennsylvania to put down the Whiskey Rebellion against his own people, by the way, in the, in the early 19, 1790s. Same issues in southern Sudan, different kinds of issues, where the national government had to send their army in because of instability inside the country. I think judging the southerners as, as, as severely as we are now, I have a problem with because it's, it, no one's been able to do this as quickly as the international community thinks the Southerners should be able to do, including our, ourselves. Other questions? There's no other questions. Yes? Um, <clears throat> I'd, like to I'd like to ask about the returnees to South Sudan. When South Sudan's independence was established, Hundreds of thousands of people came back to that country from Sudan itself, especially Khartoum, and from uh, refugee camps and from other cities in Africa. I'd like to ask about the impact. When people talk about returnees, they mostly think about, oh, humanitarian needs, what's being done for them, what's being done to help them. But I, want you to, I, I wonder if any of you can address the absorptive capacity of South Sudan in terms of these people that are coming back with their um, mostly lack of agricultural experience and the um, perhaps surprise they feel upon returning to their original homes. Where do they go and where are they absorbed and are they successful? Do they have a political impact, an economic impact? Are they increasing tensions? All those questions, thank you. Sorry. Yeah, I can and start with that. It's a very good question. Um, so on the one hand, particularly South Sudanese who are coming back from the diaspora, the, the skills are vitally needed in the government. And I think that's being put to use to, to some extent, but I think on the other hand, there are some lingering questions about the willingness to absorb some of those skills. And, and there is this question that gets asked, unspoken or, or spoken, of where were you during the war? And, and did you fight and suffer the same way me and my family did? And that's really one of the tricky dynamics that I think South Sudan is struggling with right now. Um, you know, those are the sort of uh, elite returnees. Uh, obviously, there's, there's millions of returnees, many of them who were in and around Khartoum and are coming back. 
several tens of thousands of them are still sort of stuck somewhere along the way between uh, Khartoum and South Sudan. And I think it's been a pretty, you know, on the one hand, the, the return process, I think, probably went pretty well compared to, to what could have happened, and, and the UN had a lot to do with that. On the other hand, I think it's been a pretty rough uh, existence for some of these returnees because you know, they're returning in some places to, to villages and to rural communities that they haven't been in for some time, and they had grown more accustomed to an urban or semi-urban life in and around Khartoum, and they too get the question of, of where were you these last few years or decades. Um, it's going to take some time, I think, for, for real integration of these people to happen, but, uh, but I think there is some progress in that direction. Yes, this is the final question. I asked this lady right over here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jennifer Oldman from Management Systems International. Um, a couple of you, a couple of the panelists referred to um, the dependency of both the government and civil society on foreign aid assistance, and perhaps due to complacency of the government, perhaps due to lack of uh, trust in the government counterparts of civil society. Um, which obviously leads to a uh, high perception of fr fragility. Um, what can be done to decrease this dependency um, by donors, uh, USAID in particular, and increase the competency in South Sudan? Thank you. Well, I mean, the dependency has been acute, of course, in the past few months after the oil shutdown. Uh, and it's not been, I mean, the, the resources have not been matched uh, by donors, far from it. Uh, but of course, the uh, part of the, um, you know, part of it will be addressed um, with the improvement of the relations between the two countries and hopefully uh, sustain, I would say, um, implementation of the agreements they found on the management of the, uh, you know, oil sector. Uh, that will definitely bring the revenues to the country that it needs to be able to support the uh, you know, development of many of its uh, sectors, uh, health, education, uh, etc. Now, with respect to increasing the, the, you know, the capacities of the government to indeed address uh, this, um, you know, the, both its needs and manage the revenues, uh, you know, to 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 uh, to address the needs. Um, there has been, <coughs> indeed, as as was uh, mentioned by Mr. Nats, was an effort to try and bring countries from the region to uh, to help mm -hmm. uh, professionals uh, across the board, uh, technocrats, judges, to build the capacities, work together with the officials of South Sudan. But it's a it's a long process. Uh, the United Nations invested in particular into the law and order and rule of law sector. And I would say there has been some, you know, good progress with the, with the nas national police, but it's the entire uh, judicial uh, system that needs to be uh, uh, overhauled and, 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 uh, and really, uh, you know, taken care of. So it's really a, a long-term process, uh, and it will be, I think, important to sustain the effort to uh, indeed mobilize uh, the ability of countries of the region uh, to interact with the South Sudanese and support them in a way which sometimes it's, uh, you know, much, much less disruptive or, let's say, perceived as invasive as uh, what donor countries from the West can do. Thanks. Let me just, in, in conclusion, make one comment about the oil. My own estimate is that 400,000 people, 300,000 troops, 150,000 regular, 150,000 reservists, and 100,000 civil service were on the payroll of the southern government when the oil revenue shut down precipitously. There have been no oil revenues for a year and a half until now. Okay? The gross national product declined by 65% in one year, according to the World Bank, 67%. Massive decline. So, uh, you know, uh, Francois said that the oil was revenues, what, 92%, 98% of the revenue of the government. I mean, that's true, but the consequences of that stopping were far more massive than we realized. 400,000 people stopped getting paychecks, a large number of people. So 
I think now that oil revenues have started, it will start to stabilize things. And I think some of the tension we're dealing with is the fact that the economy collapsed last year. Anyway, thank you all very much.